Hello, everyone. Dear conference participants, dear uh, speakers, uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, and heartily welcome to all of you. Um, it is with the greatest pleasure that I now have the chance to welcome our second keynote speaker, Adam Gerachu. Uh, I will briefly introduce Adam and then pass on the word to her. Adam is Neubauer Family Assistant Professor of Political Science and the College of the University, sorry, at the University of Chicago. She's a political theorist with research interest in the history of political thought, uh, theories of race and empire, and post-colonial political theory. Her work focuses on the intellectual and political histories of Africa and the Caribbean. Adam holds a joint PhD in political science and African-American studies from Yale University. She is on the faculty board of the Posen Center for Human Rights, a fellow at the Chicago Center for Contemporary Theory, and a faculty affiliate at the Center for the Study of Race, Politics, and Culture. Adam's first much appraised book, World Making After Empire, The Rise and Fall of Self-Determination, reconstructs an account of self-determination offered in the political thought of Black Atlantic anti-colonial nationalists during the height of decolonization in the 20th century, something that we've been talking about earlier today also. World Making After Empire was the winner of International Studies Association Best Theory Book 2019 and was also awarded the National Council of Black Political Scientists Du Bois Distinguished Book Award 2020 amongst uh, many other prizes. Drawing on the political thought of anti-colonial intellectuals and statesmen, uh, such as uh, Asikivi, uh, sorry for pronouncing that uh, incorrectly, uh, Du Bois, George Patmore, uh, Nkuma, uh, Eric Williams, Michael Manley, and Julius Marea, her important account of decolonization reveals the full extent of their unprecedented ambition to remake not only nations but the world. In the book, Adam shows that African African-American and Caribbean anti-colonial nationalists were not solely or even primarily nation builders. Responding to the experience of racialized sovereign inequality, uh, dramatized by interwar Ethiopia and Liberia, Black Atlantic thinkers and politicians challenged international racial hierarchy and articulated alternative visions of world making. Seeking to create an egalitarian post-imperial world, they attempted to transcend legal, political, and economic hierarchies by securing a right to self-determination within the newly founded United Nations, constituting regional federations in Africa and the Caribbean, and creating the new international economic order. Using archival sources from Barbados, uh, Trinidad, Ghana, Switzerland, and the United Kingdom, World Making After Empire recasts the history of decolonization, reconsiders the failure of anti-colonial nationalism, and offers a new perspective on debates about today's international order. And we in the group um, of this research project um, decided, and we really believe that this book is, a, is a, a seminal contribution to the global intellectual history of an unequal world. And we have been looking so much forward to uh, welcoming Adam today. The title of Adam's talk for today is Disclosing the Problem of Empire in Du Bois International Thought. And uh, we're just uh, so uh, glad that you could come, Adam. Um, before we start, um, kindly note that this session is being recorded. I kindly ask all of you to make sure that your microphones are muted. After Adam's talk, there should be time for questions. If you will uh, wish to pose a question, please indicate so by typing an X in the chat after Adam's talk. And so now it is with greatest pleasure that I can pass on the word to Adam Getachu. Please welcome her. Great. Um, thank you very much, Christian, for that warm introduction and for the invitation to join you all at what is really a wonderful conference. Um, I'm sorry that we are all scattered and I, I've missed the morning sessions, but the papers have been fantastic and the discussions I heard yesterday afternoon and so today have also been wonderful. So it's a real pleasure to join you all. 
Um, the paper I'm presenting today is part of a project, a uh, collaborative project with my colleague Jennifer Pitts, who's also in the virtual room. Um, since about 2019, uh, Jennifer and I have been working on an edited volume that collects uh, Du Bois's international thought uh, from 1900 to 1956. Um, it's a volume that will eventually come out with uh, Cambridge University Press's History of Political Thought series, and it includes about 24 essays, um, uh, uh, some, some of which published in journals, others uh, from, from Du Bois's archives. Uh, the paper I'm presenting today is also a paper that Jennifer and I have worked on together for um, an edited volume, uh, the Oxford Handbook on Du Bois, um, that should be coming out later to this year. And I think it really dovetails nicely on the um, last conversation we were having with Andrew and Sarah around these questions of international hierarchy, um, uh, racial, uh, the ways to think about racial hierarchy in both domestic and international space. So I'll just go ahead and read the paper. In recent scholarship, World War I and its immediate aftermath has come to be seen as a pivotal moment in the history of empire and international law. On the one hand, the period is marked by the rise of self-determination and the emergence of radical nationalist movements across the colonized world. The forms of anti-colonialism associated with this period evinced an institutional flexibility as yet uncommitted to the nation state form and deeply connected to transnational networks, facilitated in some cases by the communist international, but also a variety of other um, subaltern and anti-colonial internationalisms. On the other hand, the founding of the League of Nations, once considered a history in the a watershed in the history of liberal internationalism, has been recently critically reconsidered for the ways it re reproduced imperial hierarchy. The resolution of these divergent trajectories of what Erez Manella has called the Wilsonian moment gave way to the consolidation eventually of the nation state as the normative institutional form required for membership in international society. The possibility that there could be different subjects of international law, mandated peoples, minorities, individuals was gradually but decisively foreclosed um, uh, after World War I. And at the end of the Second World War, anti-colonial movements had come to uh, accept the nation state as a counterpoint to empire, even as they continued to experiment with other forms, and uh, as I discussed in the first book. Even as the international order was dramatically transformed since the Wilsonian moment and the age of de decolonization, we live in the world of nation states it helped to inaugurate. The picture of the world as composed of discrete and independent states still exercises a hold over our political imagination. This is an image in which the domestic regime and constitution of the state is disaggregated from international relations. Sovereign independence characterizes the relationship of states to each other and international organizations recognize sovereignty uh, through formal equality. This tripartite image of a domestic constitution, external sovereignty, and equal membership in international society obscures longstanding political and economic entanglements, um, especially imperial ones, that have structured and constituted the modern world. Writing in the decades when this image of the world came to be dominant, W.E.B. Du Bois in his international writing productively illuminates its blind spots and offers conceptual resources to move beyond its limits. Critical reflection on the problem of empire and a sustained attention to the relationship between domestic and international realms of politics were persistent features of Du Bois's political thought, from his earliest articulations of the argument that the color line belts the world. Yet, as for many observers and critics of empire, the outbreak of World War I ignited in Du Bois a sense of urgency and possibility that required a new analysis of imperialism. In the, in the accounts of the war's origins, and as a result also in the vision of the post-war peace embodied in the League, Du Bois encountered a studied unwillingness to take up the global color line as a necessary context and condition of war. Du Bois has practiced in this context a form of anti-imperialist critique that took as its aim exposing the imperial relations and racial structures 
that were foundational to the modern world, yet hidden in plain sight. These anti-imperial writings can be conceived, uh, we argue, as strategies of disclosure designed to reveal through new languages, metaphors, and unexpected associations, the workings of an imperial order that was increasingly described and represented during the course of his lifetime as an international community of equal nation states. Du Bois was not distinct among anti-imperial cr critics in elaborating new languages um, to grasp and represent the imperial world. If imperialism developed discursive and ideological strategies to conceal and its disavow its structuring presence and violence, anti-imperialism has always required new ways of making visible the contradictions and consequences of imperialism. Yet Du Bois's strategies emerge from the ways he cultivated a unique perspective as a black citizen of the nation fast becoming the imperial hegemon in the 20th century. The standing inflected his strategies of disclosure as he spoke with and to a fractured audience of fellow anti-imperialists, fellow African-Americans relegated to second-class citizenship and to the nation of the United States as a whole. Speaking of himself as having a certain clairvoyance, which is vouchsafed the outsider who lives within and the insider who does not belong, Du Bois combined the insights of an anti metropolitan anti-imperialism with attention to the viewpoints of the colonized and racially mar marginalized. So today I examine the tripartite image of the world as it is refracted in Du Bois's thought. First, um, the, the rise of domestic uh, democratic regimes, especially in the North Atlantic, is revealed in Du Bois's thought to be parasitic on the new imperialism of the 19th century. Second, sovereignty appears as a veil that obscures this parasitism from within the world's powerful states while shielding new forms of domination among weach, weaker states. Third, in his engagements with international organizations, he built on these insights to illuminate how uh, equal membership elided international hierarchy. So part one, democracy's imperial entanglements. In May 1915, less than a year into the First World War, Du Bois published African Roots of War, situating what appeared as an intra-European conflict in the wider context of the late 19th century's new imperialism. He argued that the causes of the war could be found in the competition for colonial territory in Africa. This argument, uh, of course, anticipated uh, Lenin's uh, uh, arguments from his 1917 imper imperialism, while reviving a longstanding Republican critique of empire as a source of geopolitical destabilization. Although Du Bois's title suggests that this relationship between imperialism and, and war um, is his main theme, the conceptual in innovation in his essay appears in his answer to the question, what was the new call for domination? Empire it itself was not new, Du Bois meant, maintained. What was novel about the scramble for Africa was that it occurred in the context of democratization. In what appears as a reference to Alexis de Tocqueville, um, though he's not named, um, he notes, most philosophers see the ship of state launched on the broad irresistible tide of democracy. For these figures, imperialism can only appear as delaying eddies here and there. For others, the persistence of hierarchy can only be explained as a reversion to aristocracy and despotism. Repurposing the Tocquevillian phrase democratic despotism, Du Bois rejects the blind optimism of the first position and the inability of the second to comprehend the depth and hold of the democratic transformation at hand. Democratization of political, economic, and social relations were indeed ushering in a new age of equality for Du Bois. Working classes gradually won suffrage and made slow but steady inroads into challenging economic inequality through workers' protections and trade unionism. Yet the forging of democratic nations in Europe and the United States was made possible by outsourcing the most extreme forms of exploitation and domination 
to the colonies or to racialized citizens. Unlike earlier agents of empire, the merchant prince or the aristocratic monopoly, Du Bois argued that the new imperialism was driven by a new democratic nation composed of united capital and labor. At work in Du Bois's account of democratic despotism are the multiple perspectives he inhabits and cultivates. First, by viewing the rise of the dominant uh, modern state from the perspective of the colonized and dominated, he, uh, he illuminates the economic and ideological bonds that hold together the democratic nation. No mere sentimental patriotism, loyalty, or ancestor worship, but increased power, wealth, and luxury for all classes on a scale the world never saw before had made possible con uh, colonial aggrandizement. And it was central to the democratic bonds internal to the imperial states. Cementing this economic logic, every available resource of science and religion was bright, brought to bear in solidifying a doctrine of racial inferiority. This reading of the relationship between the new democratic nation and imperialism can be usefully contrasted to J.A. Hobson's earlier account. Hobson directed his critical energy against advocates of imperial expansion who argued that it would help to alleviate the social question in the United Kingdom by offering new outlets of settlement, employment, and ensuring access to the raw materials needed for continued industrialization. In Hobson's view, this was merely ideological subterfuge designed to conceal that the beneficiaries of empire were in fact economic elites. Social democracy, he argued, could only be achieved by turning the attention of the democratic nation inward to the question of redistribution. Du Bois, by contrast, indicates that democracy at home was less easily disentangled from empire abroad. The thesis of democratic despotism emerges from Du Bois' keen attention to the ways in which imperialism is a necessary, as a necessary global form renders the bifurcation of domestic and international political developments difficult to sustain. By attending specifically to a democratic imperialism, he makes visible the popular material, psychic and effective investments in empire, which became obstacles to building wider anti-imperial movements within uh, empire's metropoles. In the silent revolution that has gripped modern European culture, he argued, the imperial spoils that sustained democratic society were in turn secured by white supremacy a fabric of argument and sentiment that has worked itself through the warp and woof of our daily thought with a th thoroughness few realize. Empire and the beliefs that made it palatable to ordinary citizens had corrupted the European mind, producing a deliberately educated ignorance and mutilated European senses of fellowship with humanity in its shared, inherent, in sh shared and, and inherent fragility. But while he pointed to the ways that, that Europe and the United States new democratic regimes were parasitical on colonial and racial hierarchy, he did not see despotism as a necessary logic of democracy. Instead, he argued that democratic despotism was contradictory and unsteady, ripe for analytical and political subversion. Du Bois sought to enact this subversion by realizing what he believed to be the universal promise of democratic equality. Here, Du Bois as a metropolitan critic of empire, as a witness to what he called the most rapid advance of democracy in America, which goes in hand in hand at its very centers with aristocracy and race hatred comes to the fore. He sought to persuade a metropolitan audience that their democratic gains depended on their universalization. Du Bois maintained that the chief, chief hope lies in the gradual but inevitable spread of the knowledge that the denial of democracy in Asia and Africa hinders its complete realization in Europe. In this formulation, the combination of democracy and despotism was bound to undo the egalitarian thrust of European and American societies. The vector of this erosion were the private actors and corporations whose political and economic power were enhanced by their role in imperialism. While the new imperialism had been initiated by the democratic nation, 
empire escaped democratic accountability. It generated new economic monopolies and unleashed practices of coercion and authoritarianism that would soon return to the metropoles. The first victims of this imperial boomerang were the European working classes who had been cajoled and flattered into imperial schemes, but would soon find their votes gagged and rendered impotent. By making legible the deleterious effects of imperialism, Du Bois advanced the argument that only the universalization of democracy can, can ensure its stability. Democracy, he concluded, must be made to encircle the earth. Um, I just want to note something here for our discussion before moving to part two, which is that I think there's um, the phrase democratic despotism is, I think, a very theoretically fecund generative um, concept that Du Bois mobilizes. But I think um, there are questions for, for me about, and I've been thinking a lot about this, uh, given some recent work by Bob Gooding Williams, about what exactly, what, what the empirical basis of Du Bois's claims are, what he has in mind specifically when he refers to empire, this new imperialism, as a form of democratic despotism. So that could be one topic of conversation. Um, so now I turn to part two, rethinking sovereignty. Obscuring the dependence of dem democracy stability on its universality was the conception of the Euro-American state as a sovereign entity. The image of the independent, self-contained democratic state hid from view its dependence on transnational relations of power, the exploitation of imperial subjects, and the global movement of capital. The sovereign European nation state was thus in a crucial sense an illusion, its prosperity and political order inextricable from the global system. Du Bois deploys uh, the metaphor of world shadows to highlight this deep entanglement. With nearly every great European empire today walks its dark colonial shadow, he maintains. These shadows are tightly appended to the European states, which can only be understood by likening and contrasting them with their dark double. To imagine Europe without its sh shadow is to see it only partially. If the sovereign state uh, was an illusion that it occluded its imperial nature, the sovereignty of the handful of independent Black nations was correspondingly deceptive, a plight epitomized for Du Bois by Liberia's position uh, in the 1920s. The League of Nations' sole founding member in Africa, Liberia appeared according to the ideal image of the sovereign independent state as a self-steered craft, master of her own fate. What, when held up to this image, the only question one can ask is what is wrong with Liberia? A query which presumes that the ideal of the state uh, assumed to have been achieved in, in Europe or the United States is a possible horizon for the West African country. And when this is the only question, only one answer is available and it rests on the idea of underdevelopment. This was the severest charge that modern imperialism brings against a small independent country, Du Bois argued. Du Bois makes three critiques of this developmental vision. First, the charge of underdevelopment, he argues, stems from racism. It takes no leap to imagine that a country ruled and, and inhabited by Negroes is inferior. Second, it emerges from a narrow economism in which it is assumed that unless a nation is growing in numbers and annexing territory and increasing the amount of private profits, it is decadent. This is a vision of development that has foregone other markers of progress, which cannot be tabulated as growth. Finally, the developmental vision assumes that Liberia can merely replicate the trajectory of the United States or Europe. No attention is ever paid to the specificity of its founding, which coincided with the rise of economic imperialism. Du Bois seeks to reformulate the questions we ask about Liberia, by offering different images of its status as a sovereign state. Instead of a self-steered craft, he argues Liberia is a canoe tossed on raging economic currents, which eddied out of the slave trade of the 18th century into the swirl of world war in the 20th century. These raging currents have helped fuel the dominance of Europe and the United States, who are the literal and metaphorical masters of the sea. 
Yet the conditions of possibility that assured Euro-American Euro political and economic mastery make La Liberian sovereignty impossible. Global cap capital backed by the power of imperial states who could not directly exploit land and labor saddled the country with debt represented as necessary for its development. Yet these same actors insisted that because the country was politically sovereign, its poverty should be attributed to its own internal failings, laziness and efficiency, waste inferiority, rather than the terms of its economic and financial relations with the world. Du Bois' writings on Liberia make a clear transformation or mark a clear transformation in his thinking about capitalism. What had, while he had hoped in 1920 that American loans and government contracts with the Firestone Company would provide a lifeline to the Liberian economy, by 1933, he reports he, has, he had lost faith in capitalism. On the one hand, he had hoped uh, the US, especially given its historic relationship to Liberia and in response to African-American advocacy could be persuaded to serve as a democratic counterpoint to Imperial France, uh, Britain, or Germany. On the other hand, he had planned to persuade Firestone and the US government to, to employ African-American advisors and personnel who would be more sympathetic to Liberia. And this idea of kind of African-American leadership or uh, stems from a, a sort of vanguardism that Du Bois maintained about African-Americans relationship to both Africa and the darker world that really informs his international writing in the first two decades of, of the century, but I think really begins to change also in this period. And I'm happy to say more about why. By 1933, his earlier hopes, however limited, um, ha had waned and had been crushed in part by, by experience as African-American uh, uh, diplomats were undermined by successive administrators, uh, administrations, US administrations, and American experts assisted the corporate appropriation of Liberian wealth through burdensome loans, control of land on easy terms, and lavish salaries for American agents. In a mordant echo of the conceit that America was a city upon a hill, an example to the people of the world, Liberia called, uh, uh, sorry, Du Bois called Liberia a little thing upon a hill. Here is another recasting of the image of sovereignty, where the canoe is set against currents of global capital. The thing upon the hill is cast aside as the other image of political sovereignty. Liberia had tried to use its independence and international legal standing to resist the grip of foreign capital. Its failure in this endeavor was not its own, but rather a reflection of the world's failure to constrain oligarchy. Liberia's fate was thus a portent of the future of world democracy. The little thing upon a hill serves in this sense as a warning about the limits of foreign, uh, formal sovereignty and the dangers that lie ahead for colonized people. I should say here too that there is, I think, an important echo and connection with uh, Sarah's work on, on the Ethiopian intellectuals we just heard for in this at attempt to defend the sovereignty of peripheral or semi-colonial states like Liberia, um, and this also occurs in the context of Ethiopia, Du Bois himself um, elides or obscures forms of domestic hierarchy and uh, domestic inequality within Liberia, never taking fully into consideration, for instance, the differences um, and structures of domination between African-American settlers uh, who, who constituted the uh, political elites of li Liberia and the indigenous, uh, indigenous um, subjects of, of the Liberian state. Um, but, but in important ways, uh, Liberia becomes uh, for Du Bois an example that the realization of democracy for Africans and African-Americans alike required a worldwide organization of darker nations against capitalism. And he imagined a global project of disciplined economic organization that might ultimately supplant a, a profit mad capitalism. He called on uh, the African-American community in particular to take advantage of having been shut out of the system of exploitation of the many for the benefit of the few in order to pioneer alternatives, a self-contained economic system of uh, consumer cooperatives and nonprofit industries. Um, 
in, in, in a few decades, he in, anticipated such efforts would build a stock of capital that could then be supplied to black nations now enthralled to find uh, white finance capital. Uh, he writes also in this period a, a memorandum uh, to Ethiopian representatives uh, visiting, visiting uh, New York, arguing similarly that they should um, stay away from or avoid uh, loans backed by the United States and try instead to cultivate these alternative set of economic relationships with African-Americans. Um, du Bois's vision of global solidarity and his attempts to position African-Americans as allies and with and as occupying a similar position of, of colonized subjects also informs the ways he thinks about uh, international organizations. And this brings me to part three, reimagining the international. When the League and the UN uh, were founded, Du Bois fully recognized both organizations' profound uh, shortcomings as bodies of world opinion and their constitutive inability to address what he believed were the true causes of global conflict, colonial rivalry, and the collective commitment in white societies uh, to the exploitation of dark labor. As international organizations, they at once transcended state boundaries and depended on, on them. And their self-representation as communities of equal nation states belied their domination by the imperial powers whose interests shape the agendas and procedures of both organizations. Du Bois particularly drew attention to the unequal modes of representation that structured UN membership. It cannot be reconciled with any philosophy of democracy that 50 million white folk of the British empire should be able to make the destiny of 400 million yellow, brown, and black people a matter solely of their own internal decision, he wrote. Such a situation, he argued, amounted to the virtual enslavement of 750 million people who like global black citizens of the United States will have no rights that the white people of the world are bound to respect. I think here we see a, 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 an important uh, demogra demographic imaginary that under, underwrites his vision of world democracy, that in fact, it is the world's people of color who constitute the globe's majority, and that any form of international democracy uh, would reflect, would, would reflect the, that demographic um, configuration. Uh, Yet, despite this kind of criticism, Du Bois for decades meant uh, combined the, a critique of the inherent deficiencies of these international bodies with a willingness to make use of what he could within their structures and languages. Even as he pursued alternative forms of global political organization, including the five Pan-African Congresses he, hel he helped to organize, he led appeals to the hegemonic international bodies and in doing so, he pragmatically tempered his demands uh, uh, to their limitations. At the center of this strategy was an effort to reimagine the subject of international society, moving beyond a membership strictly limited to state actors and casting colonized and minoritized peoples and, and as international agents with rights of petition and representation. Du Bois pursued this agenda with two aims in mind planning a transition of Africa from colonial subjugation to self-government and reconstituting the oppression of African-Americans as, as, uh, as a matter of international consequence. Already with the formation of the League, Du Bois advanced these two aims, accepting the premise that most Africans were not yet ready for self-government. He viewed the mandate system as a potential advance if it could be restructured through genuine internationalization of governance and a wider conception of representation. He, just, he thus rejected the assignment of a mandatory power and sought to introduce alternative actors to the international body. In his memoranda on the future of Africa submitted to President Woodrow Wilson in November, 1918, he proposed that a body of educated global pu black public opinion be recognized as speaking on behalf of colonized Africans, pledging to ascertain by a series of conferences the desires, aspirations, and grievances of the colonized. The eventual League structure strayed far from this proposal, 
And Du Bois sought once more to press for such reforms uh, during the second Pan-African Congress in 1921. These proposed reforms, such as the appointment of a black member to the Mandates Commission, were met modest, um, and they also demonstrate that Du Bois maintained an attachment to a conception of elite rule, as well as a broad commitment to a developmental prerequisite to self-government. Yet at the same time, these were efforts to insert new actors and procedures into international society. While League members, founders like Wilson had spoken of the consent of the government, Du Bois sought to create fora in which aspirations and grievances of the governed could in fact be heard. Even as his uh, vision of representation hewed closely to an organic conception of community, one in which black elites could properly count as the representatives of the colonized. In the imaginative intervention of introducing alternative voices and authorities, Du Bois's approach to the League was in fact very similar to that of the Black nationalist Marcus Garvey, his uh, political rival and critic to, during this period. But both sought to make the case for the Negro race as a non-state extraterritorial subject of international terror society one endowed with international rights and capable of self-representation on the world stage. This conception of the Negro race as an international actor informed Du Bois's effort to internationalize the question of black citizenship in America. In a second letter uh, to Wilson in November, 1918, uh, Du Bois made the case that the subjugation of African-Americans was a matter of international relevance a plight equivalent to the Poles or the Yugoslavs being liberated from the empires of Central Europe. Du Bois uh, clearly valued this letter to Wilson, um, and he mentions it in a, in a posthumously published autobiography, but it's not clear the letter ever reached uh, Wilson. Um, Jennifer and I have spent many months trying to trace whether it was received and whether there were any reply was written, but we have not found any. It's, and um, it seems to be, and this letter seems to be less an attempt to use international institutions in service of African-American emancipation, and, um, but a more private appeal to Wilson uh, to recognize the inconsistency of his own positions. Yet it is, it is instructive in its mobilization of the nascent language of minority rights and its keen awareness of the mutability of the categories of peoplehood at the time. The Peace Congress at Versailles is concerned with the rights of distinctive peoples, Du Bois argues, and a more distinctive people than the American Negro would be difficult to imagine. With the formation of the uh, UN, Du Bois uh, employed this idea that the Negro race was a distinctive people and endowed with international rights to directly petition uh, the international organization. He led and edited the NAACP's 1947 Appeal to the World, submitted to the Commission on Human Rights, as it drafted the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. In the appeal's introduction, Boys describes African Americans as a segregated caste. What makes American Negroes as distinct here is not absolute physical or racial difference from their fellow Americans, but instead a hereditary cultural unity born of suffering, of common, uh, born of slavery, of common suffering, prolonged prescription and curtailment of political civil rights, and especially because of economic and social disabilities. Alert to shifting international discourse, the call for international consideration of the oppression of African Americans combined an appeal to both minority rights of the earlier minority rights regimes and this new uh, language of human rights. The petition catalogs the denial of human rights to minorities in the case of, Negro, of citizens of Negro descent. While the minority rights regime had been ineffective, they recognized collective claims outside the terms of statehood. In the appeal and in efforts to expand the rights of colonized peoples uh, to petition, Du Bois held open the possibility that collective actors beyond states can participate in the newly formed international body. At the same time, by mobilizing human rights, the petition deployed the still malleable discourse to stage the UN as a space of appearance for the NAACP and American Negro more broadly. 
In this way, the very act of petitioning was a performance of re-enfranchisement. Still, the early discussions of, of the UN's founding, uh, since the early discussions of the UN's founding at Dumbarton Oaks, Du Bois had probed the question of how the UN could be transformed into a space of appearance for those living under the world shadow of, imperi of imperialism. When European states appeared in that space as independent and equal states, their colonial shadows were obscured and erased. Du Bois sought to give voice to these shadows by endowing the colonies with the rights of petition and uh, representation. As early as 1944, he argued for representation of the colonized peoples along the master peoples in the General Assembly. This uh, representation could take the form of voting membership or rights of complaint and petition, which, could be, which should be decided by the assembly itself rather than the great powers. He also called for the Mandates Commission, uh, renamed the Trusteeship Council, to have expansive powers to investigate colonial conditions and address complaints of colonial peoples. Finally, he argued that each imperial state must make clear and public its plans to raise the people of colonial of the colonies to a condition of complete political and economic equality with the people of the master races, um, at the, with the aim of e eventually including the colonized as fellow citizens or ensuring their independence as free people. Du Bois's view that empire need not culminate in a world of nation states was shared by many anti-colonial nationalists who had articulated federal and non-statist imaginaries well into the 1960s. Coupled with the expansive vision, vision of petitioning and representation, the institutional openness was connected to Du Bois's effort to uh, conceive a genuinely democratic internation. Unlike the United Nations, this would be an internationalism informed by the entanglements of the domestic and international the fiction of sovereign statehood and the recognition of various actors and agents within the international order. In disclosing the hidden structure and entailments of empire, Du Bois thus laid out an alternative vision of the world order. The right to petition that Du Bois demanded and performed through the appeal was not recognized at the founding of the UN or with the emergence of the Universal Declara Declaration of Human Rights. In, the, in 1960, the, the Declaration on the Granting of, Independent, of Independence to Colonial Countries and Peoples, the famous UN Resolution 1514, secured by a growing number of states joining the UN, um, finally, uh, finally managed to win an expansive right of petition to, col to colonized peoples. Uh, it created the Committee of 24, and other ad hoc bodies that directly took up complaints uh, and calls for investigation from those who were still colonized. This victory, though significant, coincided with clauses that reinforced the principle of territorial integrity. If the new right to petition opened avenues for non-state actors, territorial integrity narrowed its ambit to a particular kind of subject, colonized people subject to European alien rule. Du Bois's 1947 petition might still have found little reception in this context. In any case, he had also shifted his orientation this, at this point. Having joined the Communist Party in the United States, he settled in Ghana in 1961. While not inevitable, the process of decolonization contributed significantly to entrenching the nation state as the dominant form of international politics. Yet even with the universalization of the nation states, imperial structures and racial hierarchies continue to circumvent the ideal of sovereign and equal states as the basis of world politics. Given the ways in which an image of a world of nation states continues to obscure transnational structures of economic and political power, ours is still a world that demands new ways of surfacing what remains out of sight. Contemporary crises from the politics of immigration to the unsustainable debts uh, that saddle uh, the global south require analyses that pierce through the bounded nation state. In emphasizing Du Bois' strategies of disclosure, we seek not to recommend his specific calls for reform, which emerge out of, specific, out of a specific risk problem space, um, 
that is no longer our own. Instead, we hope to draw attention to Du Bois' view, way opposing the problem of empire, one that is ever attentive to the obfuscation in our conceptual vocabulary and institutional arrangements, and that always begins from an attunement to the porosity of the boundaries that uh, divide domestic from international. So I will stop here and take questions. Uh, thanks very much. Thank you so much, Adam. Uh, we are we're giving you uh, the, the, the most wonderful applause in, in world history. Uh, we're just uh, sorry for you can't hear it, but believe us, uh, everyone is very glad. And we have time for questions. If you have a question, please um, mark so by uh, putting an X in the, in the chat. So um, I have a uh, question from Chris Moffat, please, Chris. Thank you so much. This is kind of just a um, uh, short question to maybe invite you to speak more about a couple of things, um, maybe while other people are gathering their thoughts as well. Um, I, I really enjoyed the paper. I, I was struck by um, this kind of notion of strategies of disclosure. And I just wonder if you could say maybe a bit about the difference between the kind of um, the meetings, the sort of public events um, in Du Bois's work and how these become stages for working out those ideas versus kind of written texts. Um, very basic question there um, about that kind of public intellectual role versus other writings and things he's, he's doing um, and, and how he poses this problem, this problem of empire differently or similarly in both of them. The other is just about a concept you mentioned very briefly, which is uh, of the world shadow which um, I, I think I've seen like, I've seen before, I think Benedict Anderson uses it very, again, very briefly, but I don't actually know much about the concept. I'd love to hear more about that if you, if you happen to know or if he develops it, um, where I can look more to read about that. But thank you. Christian, do you want me to answer one at a time or do you want to gather yeah, a few? Yeah, I, I, think, I think we have, we have, um, um, we have some good time for, for these questions. So I think one at a time is, 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 is fine for now. Okay, great. Um, I'll start with the uh, the last one about uh, world shadows. Um, so the the language of world shadows. I mean, Du Bois has a variety of metaphors: the veil, the color line, the shadows that appear and reappear in ver various iterations. Um, but that specific reference I was citing comes from um, uh, the 1925 Worlds of Color uh, article which appears first in foreign affairs. Um, and I think um, what he does there is basically the essay is organized by each imperial power, um, Britain, France, Portugal, and then it does this work of kind of juxtaposition or, or, or under that category, actually what we get is the kind of imperial structures. And, and so it's, a, it's partly a comparative examination of the forms of empire different forms of empire that the three, the various European powers um, are articulating. And it, it, it comes up uh, in other spaces too, but that's the kind of uh, place uh, that it's most, most this idea of the shadows is, is most developed. Um, on your first question, it's a really interesting uh, question about the various modulations of his critiques in different places. You know, I think one, um, one thing we emphasize in the edited volume is actually about the significance of the form of the essay itself. Many of these writings that we're, um, we've collected uh, and most of his writings about imperialism come in the form of essayistic, essayistic interventions. And I think there's something, there's something about the essay that alerts us to kind of this, you know, kind of questions of audience, rhetoric, uh, the kind of historical context or moment that inspires a particular kind of intervention in a set of debates. And it's also a way of charting, I think, um, transformations in his thought over time. Um, so I think, and I, I don't, I, we, I mean, I, I won't speak for Jennifer, I guess. I, I don't think that there is this kind of ruptures in Du Bois's thought, but there is clearly development and transformation. And you can both chart that development and transformation and um, 
you know, uh, think about the ways in which each of these are kind of very specific kinds of interventions, attempts to speak to different kinds of audiences. Um, a, a, a second thing that's really important about the essays is how many of them were actually published in quite significant at the time journals. Um, many of them are actually drawn from foreign affairs and its pre predecessor um, journal of race development. So, um, you know, he's very alert to these questions of audience. I, I think another place to think about this is actually in the context of the Pan-African Congresses, this real, you know, I think, uh, those projects for him are in part ambivalent projects is because they are bringing together, you know, people across imperial, national, linguistic boundaries, and people who have very different kind of ways of thinking about the problem of empire, different relationships to imperial powers, right? Um, in France, uh, when they meet in Paris, and also in Lisbon, uh, you know, he's quite dependent on colonial uh, subjects who have certain kinds of relationships with the imperial state. And these are also figures who have a much more, let's say, conservative or moderate, uh, you know, relation, a, a vision of reform and working within the imperial structures rather than, uh, you know, a total rejection or critique of imperial power. So in these contexts, you see him, I think, um, modulating his own pres prescri prescriptions. And I think those are kind of documents in which you see also a sort of collective authorial voice, which is where it's hard to say, you know, is this Du Bois or is this is this a kind of concession uh, to, um, you know, the, um, the context in which he's writing about. I mean, I think this is also perhaps this is one reason why the kind of, um, the novel form becomes an important place for him to chart his vision of internationalism, the 1920s. During the 1920s, he writes Dark Princess, um, this very interesting uh, novel that's charting out a kind of vision of, of international, transnational solidarity, but in the genre of romance. And, and so, you know, that becomes a space to uh, articulate a kind of idealized conception of the form of international solidarity that in the Congresses is actually very difficult uh, to achieve. We have a question from Andrew Ivaska. Thanks very much. Um, this is a fantastic uh, project that, that you and Jennifer are, uh, are, are doing um, and, and really great talk. Uh, I'm, my question has, uh, has to do with the, the petitions and whether you have, um, whether you two have, have a sense of what Du Bois is, a little more of a sense of what Du Bois's hopes were for what these petitions would, would result in or what kinds of petitions would be made. Um, or even perhaps, I'm forgetting what year Du Bois passed in, whether he had any reactions to the petitions that started to be made. And the reason I'm asking is because um, I, I, I'm, I'm working with a student who's working on petitions from Tanganyika uh, in the early 1960s. And what you see there is often a petitions that neither, um, neither are conforming to the, to the territorial boundaries of a future nation state. So in that way, it would seem to, um, to play to Du Bois's hopes that this would not simply you know, sort of reinstate the, you know, or, or, um, or instate a nation state um, form. But nor do they, um, nor are they uh, often reaching beyond the territory. And, in, and what you see instead is a kind of, um, you know, another route for material sort of petitions that are maybe sub, sub territorial in, um, in scope, I guess, in, in terms of a constituency. Uh, so, yeah, I, I'm just curious of whether Du Bois sort of had a vision for what petitions would um, would be able to sort of form as a unit of a, a political unit of um, solidarity. Hmm. That's a great question, and I think it's an invitation for us to try and see if he, you know, wrote about or thought about uh, the practices of petitioning, both in the in the moment of the trusteeship council, but also earlier, and um, he dies in 1963, so it's likely he 
didn't have as much um, access to, or he was writing much less after in that, in the period that he was in Ghana after it's 1960. Um, so it's, it's likely that he had less access to that, but there is this earlier moment also of a proliferation of petitioning um, in the League of Nations and in, uh, in the Mandate Commission. Um, so it'd be interesting to, to see if he has anything to say specifically about the kinds of petitions that were mobilized. I think I would say, you know, the, the petition he is involved with, uh, with the uh, NAACP, I think for him, this is one attempt at um, you know, elevating the question of, of African American rights into an international question. That's one uh, use of the petition. Two, I think it's also an attempt to intervene, strategically intervene um, in the formation of the UN and to propel through these actions, to propel the, or, the kind of vision of human rights to take a much more expansive and transnational form. I think, though, you know, in the in the terms of um, you know who he thinks might uh, you know avail themselves of these uh, forms of petition, uh, again, the 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 example of the petition from African Americans suggests that he, he could he could think about you know subnational or minority groups within a territorially bound space exercising the rights of petition, but his his conception of kind of post-colonial futures often takes the form of either, you know, either these would be states, you know, um, uh, that may may have regional or federative possibilities down the line, or they're going to be kind of incorporated into the empires as these kind of transnational um federations sort of on the model that Césaire and Senghor and other Francophone figures are thinking about a Fr French Union. Um, so that that suggests that, you know, he actually doesn't have this, um, uh, you know, conception of, of kind of subnational configurations within the colonial space as he does within the context of the U.S. And I think, um, uh, Aziz Rana just gave a talk uh, on Du Bois's international thought at Chicago, and he makes the argument that Du Bois, throughout his life, maintains a commitment to strong, large states um, because of his kind of attachments to modernization, development, etc. So it's hard to imagine that he he can conceive of um, you know, uh, subnational groups or decentralized forms of, of rule or or even anti-state, you know, more radically anti-statist kind of configurations of post-colonial futures. Thanks. That's great. We have a question from Darren McMahon. Darren, please. Yeah, thank you, Adam, so much. A wonderful talk and, and, and really looking forward to the volume. In fact, that's my first question. Do you and Jennifer know when the Cambridge volume may be out? Because I think a lot of us are going to want to read it. Um, and the second uh, is, is really just a follow up to your invitation to talk a little bit more about Du Bois's thinking about the role of African American diplomats in Liberia and uh, in Africa more generally. And I'm, 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 I guess I'm curious uh, about his thinking of, of the role of elites in negotiating uh, the kind of space between the national and inter international and whether or not this has any um, echo of his idea of a, of a talented 10th uh, and, and the kind of the role of that they play in, in leadership. Yeah, great, thanks. Um, on the volume, I mean, we've we've submitted it and I we are hoped that it will be out hopefully at least early next, sometime next year, I guess, um, if not by the end of this year. Um, but yes, uh, it's 2022. Uh, on the question of elites, um, yeah, I think that's a great, it's a great question. I mean, I think there's two schools of thought about Du Bois and, and on, on leadership and on the Talented Tenth. One is an argument that, you know, that of course the vision of the Talented Tenth um, and a conception of elite leadership really structures Du Bois's early thinking. Uh, it's all over Souls of Black Folk in particular, that was 1903 and perhaps best known text. Um, and, uh, you know, it's, it inflects his, his, his thinking more broadly. And this idea of the elite leadership is premised on 
two kinds of arguments about African Americans. One um, that that the you know black masses are kind of uh, so sociologically deficient, right? And they have have to undergo a process of development or civilization. Um, and the second argument that black elites are best positioned to do that work, not only because they've achieved a certain kind of civilization themselves, but also because they have this kind of organicist tie with, with the masses, right? Um, and this is an argument that Bob Gooding Williams um, makes in his book, In the Shadow of Du Bois, a reading of, it's a reading of Souls of Black Folk. Now that, so, so one kind of argument about Du Bois is that as especially he develops a more Marxist analysis in the interwar period, this conception of leadership, you know, begins to melt away and it's a less significant part of his um his thinking um and then another argument uh, made most powerfully by adolf reed that this is actually a through line in his in all of his work um, and remains persistent you know my own thought is i i i think i feel ambivalent about this question or i'm trying to chart an in between space on the one hand i think in the, especially in the context of the international thought, there is a real shift in Du Bois's imagination of the place of African Americans. So um, the first essay, the volume we'll start with is this uh, speech he makes uh, in 1897, is published in 1900 as the present outlook of darker races. And it's again, one of these essays that's like spans the globe thinking about the character of empire, but it really looks at um, the Spanish-American War and and the U.S.'s recent uh, acquiring of, of of the Philippines of of Puerto Rico. And in that essay, he makes the argument that, or he says, African Americans should guide and guard our new colonial subjects. Right, that that they can be models and leaders for um, for kind of Filipinos and new colonial other new colonial subjects. Um, and I think that does mirror exactly this kind of conception of the talented ten African Americans are, are, are you know, even as they're uh, marginalized, they're, um, you know, have an, uh, access to a certain form of civilization. There's a second part of that argument, which is, I think, an attempt to make space for African Americans in the U.S. project of, uh, you know, uh, uh, empire. And it's co connected to a later argument he makes for African American participation in World War One. So an argument for citizenship based on, you know, uh, participation in the in the nation's global projects. You know, I think beginning in the 1920s, Du Bois begin uh, reverses some of this thinking, and a really key moment I think is is Du Bois's encounter with um, Indian anti-colonial nationalism. And the example of kind of um, uh, early uh, Gandhian mobilizations and nonviolence, the example of nonviolence, its model of mass action coming from India. And he thinks, you know, this is really a lesson for the world, including for African Americans. So there's this sense in which actually the guides and guards and guides may be some, you know, located elsewhere in the, in the dark world. And the novel Dark Princess also plays plays this up because in it's a highly oriental text, but in that text, it's an, the Indian princess is the person who's like the leader of the dark peoples, rather. And the African American is supposed to be figure who's the lead fig, figure is kind of, kind of to, to be tutored by her. I mean, so I think what this suggests is that there is some continuity about his thinking about leadership or leadership and elite politics continues to play a central role in his conception, but who the leaders are going to be, uh, you know, changes over time, I think. And I think there is also more space for just generally thinking about mass politics, democratic politics in his later writings than in the kind of early part of his thinking. Thank you. Sorry, I'll give him briefer answers. <laughs> Thank you so much, Adam, it's great. Um, we were just talking about India and Gandhi. I don't know if, if that's what you want to also bring up here, Priyanka, but Priyanka, please, the uh, next question is, is from you. Thank you, Adam, for this wonderful uh, lecture. Really enjoyed it. I would like to, uh, you just mentioned about Du Bois' connection with the anti-colonial movement struggle in India, but I would like to bring attention to his correspondence with Ambedkar, who was this big leader of 
uh, the Dalits, the lower caste people, the whole struggle or against caste-based inequalities is something which has contributed to his efforts. And in terms of his impact in shaping a certain idea about the self with, with, the, with, with the whole um, language of dignity, because Ambedkar takes on to the uh, movement in terms of the worth of the individual. And he's drawing a lot of parallels between the caste and race problem, the race problem in America and the caste problem in India. Interestingly, uh, Ambedkar politics is radical. It's very distinct from Gandhian idea of nonviolence. So it, it is, I would be very interested in knowing this kind of influence, like Du Bois reading nonviolence as a method, but goes on to shape a very radical idea of social political activism. And I'm also interested in knowing, uh, was there a religious idiom in Du Bois writing? Because Ambedkar, who's very critical of religion, because religion becomes the source of oppression and subjugation, goes on to choose a religion for the larger transformation. Then he moves to Buddhism. He converts into Buddhism and gives a very radical reading of, of, of Buddhism. So was there any uh, religious idiom? And my second question is, his understanding of, did his understanding of the state transform with his uh, later uh, uh, joining of the Communist Party, becoming a Marxian? Did he give an alternative reading of the stage towards the latter part of his life? Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you. That, um, those are great questions. Um, you know, he uh, corresponds uh, with a number of anti-colonial figures in, from India, uh, from Lajpat Rai in, in the early 20s or uh, um, uh, Tagore, um, and Bekar and, and Gandhi as well. And he uh, profiles, he also prints profiles of Gandhi and Tagore in, in the crisis newspaper, the NAACP's publications. You know, I, I, haven't, I haven't looked at this systematically enough in Du Bois's writing, but I was struck actually as uh, giving the talk how the language of caste appears in the, in the um, 1947 appeal. And it, I haven't done this systematically, but it would be, I think, interesting to trace and track when, whether caste is a kind of, you know, ongoing um, idiom of, of, of Du Bois's thinking in the, or whether it really emerges in this late, later period, the 1940s period, where there's a whole body of scholarship, Afri uh, African-Americans engaged in this debate about whether race and ca whether caste is a useful analytic for thinking about race, and with figures writing on both sides of that. Um, I would also just here point to the work of, of Hari Ramesh, uh, who's a, a recent PhD and working precisely at this intersection of race and caste, writes about Ambedkar, but writes about the caste school of race relations in the United States too, and the ways in which um, this thinking about caste goes on to shape uh, really important elements of the civil rights movement, um, like the Brown v. Board of education decision. Um, on the question of, of religion, um, Du Bois is heavily steeped in, you know, kind of religious metaphors, uh, like, you know, citations, invocations of the Bible at various moments. I, I've just, just finished teaching a class in which I taught souls of black folk. And it's really hard to not read that text without some sense of the kind of Christian imaginary but I don't think he's a, you know, he's not a religious thinker of the kind that, say, Martin Luther King is, right? One that's, you know, it, um, deploying um, Christianity in his kind of arguments for equality. Uh, but I think there's two ways that Christianity plays a role, or at least two ways. I'm sure there are many others. Um, one is that um, he develops in, in an essay called Souls of White Folk, um, in, uh, it published in Dark Water, um, a critique of what he calls white Christianity. And it's this argument that whiteness itself functions as a form of religion, right? It has a certain kind of, um, you know, it, it invokes the same kinds of attachments and identifications that, that religion and Christianity does. And that is also one of the places where you see the kind of hypocrisies of, uh, uh, of, of European civilization, that it's, you know, 
does empire in part in the name of of Christianity, but it couldn't be further from you know the values of, of Jesus Christ. Um, uh, the second way I think religion plays an important role for him is partly sociological about the significance of the Black church as an institution of Black social and political life in the United States. Um, he has an essay about the church and preachers in Souls of Black Folk. He remains interested in both the kind of the possibilities of the church as, as one site of, of facilitating um, black politics, black leadership, right? But also kind of consistently critical of its conservative dimensions and the ways that it fails to fully live up to the promises, you know, of, of black institution building. Um, so I think those would be two ways that kind of questions of religion come up. The third question about the state, um, I don't really, you know, what, what's interesting about his kind of Late, late joining of the Communist Party is that unlike many Black communists, anti third world communists who, you know, in this period of the 50s and 60s really begin to distance themselves from the Soviet Union and articulate a kind of alternative version of communism, he actually spends his latter years in kind of complete defense of the Soviet Union um, and, and Stalin um, and uh, in ways that are you know, we try to make sense of a little bit in our introduction uh, to the volume, but I think uh, much more can be said and written about that period. I think, uh, again, to just cite this this talk that Aziz Rana gave, one argument he made that in that context that I think was really persuasive and interesting is that Du Bois is always looking for countervailing powers. Like he, he you know, he has this idea that Europe and the United States constitute one form of global power. And he needs kind of a form of a state or a, a power that can counteract uh, that that power, balance that power. And um, in the 30s, uh, 20s, and 30s, he becomes very interested in, in, in Japan, Japan and Japanese imperialism as a kind of that as a as filling that role potentially. Um, and in that moment, too, you know, defends uh, Japanese imperial expansion. And in ways again that echoes um, many uh, black figures during that that period. Um, so I think this both this search for kind of countervailing power, and also a commitment to developmentalism to modernization, sh shapes uh, you know his defense of of, of um, the state. I mean, I think what he thinks the state should do uh, changes radically, um, and you know by the, when he's defending the Soviet Union. It's as a project of and as an experiment in um, you know radical forms of redistribution, um, a transformation of domestic hierarchies and inequalities. Thank you very much. Um, I have three um, persons uh, with questions. Uh, first, Patrick Eber. Um, after that, Seep Sturman, and then I have put myself on. Um, if you wish to pose a question, please remember to. Mark with an X, but first, um, Patrick, please. Well, I think I can maybe go very quickly because Priyanka sort of anticipated my question. It was going to be about uh, his engagement with um, communist internationalism. I mean, he has a longer standing commitment to Marxism, but then there's a move towards, as you've just described, um, an internationalism which is directly connected to the uh, to the communist movement. I hope that doesn't sound like a kind of red baiting question. <laughs> I mean, he suffers, of course, uh, yeah, I think he has his passport uh, revoked uh, in 1952 or something like that when he's trying to go to a, a peace congress, which was, um, you know, sort of a Soviet-led peace initiative. Um, and I think that uh, that is Aziz's point about countervailing powers makes a lot of sense in that context. But maybe there's no question now since you've you've already sort of answered and and described it. So Christian, why don't you go ahead? Do you want to comment on this, Adam, or? Um, I could just say quickly, I think that, um, you know, it's uh, as early as World War One, or right after in 1919 in a crisis editorial, he, he says, uh, you know, the greatest thing to come out of the war is the Bolshevik revolution as an experiment in, um, uh, you know, in uh, democracy, 
as a project of kind of um, realizing equality. Um, so there, and he goes to Russia on several occasions, once in the 1920s, and those become really, continue to become really influential for him. Um, those trips become really touchstones as he continues to think about what might be possible, um, you know, I think he he's not um it's a, he's his his commitments to marxism or communism are never really um uh orthodox let's just say you know i think he continues to think for instance uh of course he continues to think race uh matters as a you know independent analytic and as an independent site of power i think he remains uh committed uh to the humanism of his early years throughout his, throughout this period. What it seems important to me about the like the writings of the Cold War period and the ways he's thinking about Russia in relationship or the Soviet Union in relationship to the United States is also the ways that it becomes an opportunity for him uh, to think about the kind of power that the United States is becoming in the context of the Cold War. I mean, he writes really importantly about the, the totalitarian tendencies of the anti-communism of this period. And it seems to me that in addition to um, the kind of countervailing power, the like lifelong or career long uh, interest in, in the Bolshevik revolution and its, its afterlives. Uh, in addition to that, I think there's a way in which his marginalization, his, uh, you know, uh, persecution uh, in the 50s propels a kind of greater identification with the Soviet Union by, in this period. Thank you. Um, Seep Sturman, question from you. Uh, Seep, you're muted. Wonderful. No, I'm, no, it's okay. Yeah, we could. I want, want to thank you for your excellent and to me really imaginative and I have taken a lot from your lecture. Let me say that. Um, and I'm like there and I'm looking forward to the handbook that you and Jennifer are publishing together. And by the way, hello, Jennifer, good to see you. Um, I have two questions. First of all, when Du Bois writes in the middle of the First World War in his second revised essay on the, on the soul of white folks. I, as a white man, like, like that essay enormously. And in that essay, he takes a, a darker vision of European civilization than you have painted him do later on. He says, he, he says we, we're looking at the onslaught, at the fire and smoke, at the murder and the killing of people on an unprecedented scale. And this is not an exception. This, this is Europe. This is the very south of Europe, they say. And, and later on, you give the impression that he believed that democratic despotism, also the democratic side in Europe, was possible to evoke, while well, the situation in Europe politically worsened from one year to another. So um, I guess that, that the boys never got a consistent idea about um, what Europe was and what it wasn't. He has very good memories of his stay in, 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 in central Germany, where, where he could socialize with white people in a way that was impossible, of course, unthinkable in the United States. And so, and when, when the, ri the rise of Nazism, he, he, he paints a very black picture, and so did other people of the, the NRCCP. And one of them came back to America and their reporter asked him, what do you think of, uh, of Nazi Germany? And his answer was, I prefer Alabama. That's an answer that a black man would not soon give. And the, one, the other pro position is about communism. He found in that the Bolshevik revolution a great new experiment in what humanity can do. But in the 30s, who, he also talk, talked about the, 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 the new terrible despotism that had the rise in under Stalin. And then he says, well, that we must not have in the United States, but that cannot lead to anything good. So he is wavering about communism too a bit. It is not um, the, the kind of defense of the Soviet Union he, in his later years after the Second World War, is, is, is 
is harder and less nuanced than what he says in the 30s. My last question is about Japan. Did he say anything, related anything to the attempt of Japan at the Versailles conference to get an um, article in, on the equality of races in the charter of the of, of the, 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 United Nations, the, the League of Nations? That is a factual question. Yeah, great. Um, thank you. So I'll just start with the, the last and then uh, go up. Um, on Japan, yes, uh, he did, you know, he, he didn't write like an essay specifically on, on the racial equality clause, but he mentions it, he supports it, um, and he views the kind of ultimate rejection of the racial equality clause as one of the things that really makes the League of Nations bankrupt, right? Um, that it, this is going to be a, a kind of... Um, uh, you know, he still continues, of course, to engage with the League after its formation, but he really views this as a defeat and as an indication of the ways that the League of Nations will continue to be a site in which um, global white supremacy is institutionalized, basically. Um, I think you're, you know, on the first two things, I just want to say that one, um, precisely this ways in which Du Bois wavers and, and shifts and says many things about both the question of communism and, and the question of you, what European civilization is, I think is, is you know, one of the reasons, again, why I want to just reiterate the point about what the essay form allows us to see, right, about the shifting sets of arguments, the reasons why he might, you know, have one view of, um, of, of you know communism or white supremacy at one moment and another an, another moment, I, you know I think also it raises questions about and Andrew was mentioning this um, in the last session about well what counts as inter intellectual thought uh, you know um, I think for many of us uh, uh, or some of us in political theory in particular there's a real premium on consistency right and on you know coherence of argument across time. And I think one of the first times we presented this, uh, the introduction of our edited volume, Jennifer and I got questions precisely about Du Bois' inconsistencies, right? And I think in some ways um, that speaks to what he was most importantly, which is a political thinker and one who, who was trying to intervene in very particular kinds of debates, uh, you know, and around uh, at, at, at specific moments. Um, more specifically, I think, um, on the communism point, yes, I mean, I think you're right that he moves from what is a much more ambivalent set of uh, uh, reflections towards a more kind of strident defense. I think you see that also in his relationship to Japanese imperialism, where in, in early essays, he has this kind of more, uh, you know, both a sense of um, the, the achievements of, of, of Japan, um, having moved from a kind of marginal state to a powerful state, a, a small, small state to a big state, as Sarah put it earlier, um, but a sense also that the kind of, that it was a capital state and that this meant that it would generate new forms of inequality. When, um, as anti-Japan sentiment uh, um, uh, grows in the United States, and after he, he takes a tour in 1936, he comes back much more defensive, uh, much more uh, uh, stridently in favor of the Japanese state. Um, and I think that's both a reaction to what he thinks is a kind of overblown critique of, or overblown and hypocritical critique of um, uh, Japanese imperialism. Um, the, this he he and this you know this is occurring at the same time that Italy has invaded Ethiopia, and he makes a very important you know co comparison of this that no one is doing. The League has absolutely nothing to do or say about Italy and Ethiopia, but everyone in the West is up in arms about Japan. You know, and so I think there's also though this way that. Um, I guess one thing to say about this is also that the, the kind of analytic of the color line that Du Bois mobilizes so powerfully for you know, 50, 60 years of his life is, is a really powerful tool of kind of understanding the world, the imperial world, that it has these kind of blind spots itself, right? And the blind spot here is that he takes a kind of, given the, his argument about the color line for him, 
a colored empire, i.e. the Japanese empire, is somehow less um, less bad, right? Less uh, less of a problem for him than kind of white empire, right? And so I think this we can see as one of kind of the blind spots or limitations of this form of analysis. Um, so I'll just stop there. I hope that's helpful. Okay. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Adam. I have myself um, on, on the list uh, with uh, a question and a half, I think. Um, thank you. Uh, thank you so much for this. Uh, so one, one question is, is, is on um, the kind of um, influence of his ideas in a kind of a, a, a little bit of a broader perspective. And the other question goes to the uh, contemporary re relevance of his ideas. Um, um, so uh, one of the things you picked up in the talk was this idea of a, a kind of a parasitism of, uh, you know, Western welfare on the uh, economic entanglements with the region, regions outside the US and Europe. Uh, I was wondering to which degree that was, you know, a central thought of his and, and to which degree, you know, he was uh, influential in, 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 in passing on that idea, which I think becomes also relevant in the 60s, 70s discussions about the welfare state in Europe and how it actually relies upon uh, this very unequal place in the world um, economy and the world political system. And then in connection with that also, because you describe so well how, for example, in the case of Liberia, its, its, its role in the world and its trajectory is caught up in this um, external entanglements uh, with the world's uh, capitalist system. Uh, and a lot of these different things, they kind of resonate with what we've been talking about, uh, some kinds of Marxism, some kinds of dependency theory, even some kinds of like world systems theory. So I'm just wondering how he kind of, how his influences fit into that picture, where, whether he is uh, influential uh, on those, uh, with those ideas. And, and then the second question, uh, which I think you you hinted at towards the end of your talk. Uh, so I think um, I'll also end, end my question here is, um, if you want to uh, elaborate a little bit on what you see as the kind of present day perspective on, on reading Du Bois today. Um, we had a, another visitor recently, Sam Moyne, I think he put it really nicely when he said that our thinkers are dead, they don't need us, but we need them. Uh, I, I kind of like that. I know as a historian, you probably maybe don't want to go there, uh, but, but since you hinted at it, you know, what can he tell us about the uh, unequal world we're living in today? So those are two questions or one and a half. Yeah, great, thank you. Um, you know, on the first one, um, I, think, and this is also in some ways uh, echoing something Sarah said uh, about um, uh, Gabriel Hewitt um, of, the, of the early period, but I think in general, examining the writings, and this is not just true of Du Bois, uh, but examining these writings of the late 19th and early 20th century, I invite us to think about a longer intellectual history of something like dependency theory or world systems theory, like to not, you know, those have been, of course, their specific schools of thought, they come out of specific intellectual trajectories and itineraries. But I think, you know, examining a kind of long durée view of critiques of uh, unequal integration of dependency of dependency just illuminate the ways in which that has been a kind of persistent set of arguments and and um, ways of framing the world. Um, so it's I think less that less to say that when people were having those debates in the 1960s and 70s that they were citing or indexing Du Bois himself, but that we might locate him along with other figures of the early 20th century as part of a global conversation of trying to come to terms with the consequences of European domination, right? And, and ways of analysis and analyzing that set of um, uh, predicaments. Um, um, so, you know, I think, I do think he is very influential in the worlds of Pan-Africanism and uh, uh, that I, that I've looked at partly in the first book, you know, he, he's, he's, his, his invocations of the color line are implicitly or explicitly 
the backbone of the ways in which figures like Nkrumah and Williams and others think about their own predicament as anti-colonial nationalists, as statesmen trying to work out a set of responses to these problems of unequal integration and racial hierarchy. Um, on the question of what are the, pre uh, the present uh, stakes of reading Du Bois, you know, on, on the one hand, I think, um, I guess the emphasis here on, on like the strategies of disclosure uh, set of arguments, I think someone, the first question I'd actually said, could you say more about that? And I realized I never said anything more about that. So I apologize, but um, um, uh, so I think the emphasis on that is to say, you know, it may be that some of the things that Du Bois um, made visible in his own time, say about this question of parasitism or the 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 uh, porosity of the boundaries between the domestic and the international, are at least in some circles now wi quite widely known. There's whole schools of thought, you know, that have articulated these claims for the kind of post-colonial period. Um, but I think what you know. Um, what an emphasis on these strategies of disclosure asks us to think about is how does one actually make those arguments visible, right? What forms of representation, images, rhetoric, et cetera, might we mobilize in service of kind of illuminating the set of predicaments? And this, I think Du Bois did this always with an eye to trying to identify possible agents of transformation, right? who would be the people who would take up these arguments uh, or how could these arguments be taken up by political actors in service of political transformation. And I think that, um, you know, it doesn't offer us a set of answers exactly, but, and it may not be that, you know, we can use his own strategies or images, et cetera, as I've just said, there are limits to the kinds of images he himself mobilized, but it alerts us to that task of both disclosing a set of predicaments and uh, per, the tasks of persuasion, right? And the tasks of mobilization, uh, which were the things he, you know, as both a political thinker and a political, you know, actor tried to um, bring together. I think that's one, you know, two, I remain to, I still think that there's so much work to be done to thinking about this question of what how to think the domestic and the international together right um how to think about both inter in domestic hierarchies and in, and international hierarchies or as co-constituted trying to think about how really the international structure shapes uh, state formation especially in the kind of semi-colonial colonial and colonized parts of the world right and i think this this kind of orientation towards really thinking of the domestic and international spheres of politics and economics as entangled and uh, necessarily related to each other is 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 the beginning of you know it's a, it's a kind of premise that needs to be fleshed out that needs to be thought of in all these different spaces i think the other thing i'd say about that is that it's an opportunity also to think about the not just, you know, the states like Liberia, right, the colonized and semi-colonial states as products of international imperial uh, formation, but also to think about Europe or the United States as similarly the products of these forms of uh, these wider relations. Thank you so much, Adam, and thank you so much for coming here. Um, in this virtual room. Thank you for your for excellent uh, talk. Thank you for all the wonderful questions. Uh, we will applause you once again the best we can. And um, thank you so much. Thank you very much. Thanks for all the questions.